Okay, so in this chapter, we will be talking about medical technology. This is a longer lecture, so I'm going to split it into two parts. So let's just get going here. So what is medical technology? Well, you can get kind of the, the technical version from a uh, definition from our book, uh, the practical application of the scientific body of knowledge for purposes of improving health and creating efficiencies in healthcare. Right. So this is really the super um, power of the United States. Most medical technology advances are done in the United States, in the world, right? We do more of that than anybody else. And, and that makes our health system both more expensive and better. So one of the t concepts I want you to understand here are complements and substitutes. These are economic terms. The idea here is on the one hand, a complementary technology is used um, in conjunction with something else to improve the delivery of care. So for example, uh, an LNA uh, uses a lift to make her work or his work easier, safer for the patient, uh, and more efficient. A substitute technology allows for, for the replacement of one kind of delivery mode with another kind of delivery mode. So a lot of pharmaceuticals, for example, are becoming substitutes for surgical interventions. So we'll talk about both of these, but I want you to have those two ideas in your head as we talk about medical technology. And then, of course, providers use medical technology to provide higher quality, lower cost, and or greater quantity of care, right? So we're still trying to solve that cost, quality, and access, and access problem that we have universally, not just in the United States, but universally. So, uh, for example, we can use telehealth to provide better access at lower cost and at the same level of quality, depending on the, you know, obviously you're not going to do surgery by telehealth, but psych psychiatric care is becoming more and more common to be done by telehealth rather than in person. That saves time both for the provider and for the patient. All right, so let's dive in here. We'll talk about these are our topics for the lecture. So we'll talk, we'll start out with some dry stuff talking about regulation and economics boring but important. Uh, then we'll talk about medical devices, pharmaceuticals, and IT uh, in kind of three sections of the technology that we want to talk about. So one of the things we talk about uh, a lot in, in economics and a lot in health economics and health policy discussions a lot is market failure. Uh, but we also have uh, a, a area that we fail to talk about a lot in policy I talk about it, but policy people don't, is government failure. So market failure is when the market fails to provide an optimal solution, fails to provide that cost, quality, and access. And so usually because we look at that and we say, wow, they're not providing as, you know, the market's not providing the level of care that we want, uh, government must step in. Well, the problem is that government, when government steps in, a lot of times it screws things up even more than before. So that's called government failure. And they're both legitimate. They both, uh, there are market failures and there are government failures. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We'll talk about some theories of regulation, public interest versus public choice. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the FDA, uh, cost benefit analysis, supply side controls, and certificate of need laws. So this is one of my favorite so I'm, I'm going to start tying in some more to history um, and broadly one of the, you know, this is, this is from the federalist number 51. So this is when um, uh, we were trying to get our constitution written back in the 1780s and Madison and his team were writing these short essays, trying to make an argument for the particular kind of federalist constitution that they were they wanted so this is a great quote if men were angels no government would be necessary right so here are the ideas i'm just going to read this and talk about each piece of it a little bit if men were angels no government would be necessary right so if we were all angels and we weren't out there looking out for our own best interests and screwing people over periodically well then we wouldn't need any government right so if angels were to govern govern men 
neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So here's the idea that, okay, so if we're not all angels, and maybe we could have angels go govern us. Well, we don't have angels in government. Um, you know, uh, last eight years, a pretty good example. You probably either liked one or the other presidents. Uh, I don't particularly like either one of them. Um, but chances are you identify with one or the other more and you would definitely say, well, that party, them, they are not angels. Clearly, they're not angels. At least our guys aren't that bad. But those other guys aren't angels. But the other side is saying the same thing about your guys. So, you know, the fact of the matter is when people get elected to government office, they don't suddenly become angels. So, again, we need external and internal controls to make sure that people who are acting as government agents do not get away and start using their power for their own interests. So then it goes on in framing a government, which is to be administered by men over men. The great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place, in the next place, oblige it to control itself. This is a, this is an important point here, right? So we're going to give the government, we give the government at all levels, enormous amounts of power. Think about just your local government. Police have guns and they have legitimate, they can legitimately use force against you. So we really want to make sure that those police are, are under tight control so that they can't just start using their guns randomly uh, to hurt people or to pursue their own interests. Uh, so then it finally says a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessary necessity of auxiliary precautions. So the dependence on the people, the idea of democracy, right, is really important because ultimately the check on an elected government is to have them voted out. But there's a lot of kind of wiggle room in there. And so uh, a lot can happen between elections, as we all learned over the particularly over the last few years and so uh we need to have other controls in there so just a really interesting um piece of us history there okay so let's talk about market failure and government failure a little more so market failure as i said is when markets fail to produce the socially efficient quantities of goods and services at socially efficient prices so what does that mean well we turn over you know we say all right the 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 market will provide uh the amount of care we want at the price we want in the quality that we want, right? Cost, quality, access. When I say market, what do I mean? Private actors, individual doctors or, or medical groups that are not part of the government, that are not government agents, competing with each other. So we might have medical group A and medical group B, and they're going to compete with each other to sell you the best, highest quality, lowest cost, most efficient uh, care possible. And sometimes that just doesn't work out because sometimes maybe there's only one medical group in your community and they can just price however they want or they can behave however they want, right? So that's when markets start to fail, uh, particularly so one area might you might be familiar with is monopoly, right? So when there's one provider, and that's not uncommon, particularly in New Hampshire, it's not uncommon to see one hospital servicing a fairly large area, um, geographic area. So who, who's going to check the behavior of the hospital leadership if there's no other competition? And so that can lead to market failure. And so that's when we would hope that government would step in and fix things. But, <clears throat> but there are problems with government failure. And there's two kinds of government failure as well. So government sometimes, right, because men are not angels um, and are not omnipotent and omniscient, right? They're not all powerful and they're not all knowing because government is made up of men and men are not omniscient. And so you have passive government failure, which is when government fails to act to correct a market failure. So the idea is that you have a market failure and the government doesn't act. And then you have active government failure, which is when government action results in a worse outcome than if markets uh, forces had been left alone. And so kind of this great line, you know, this idea of is the cure worth the, worse than the disease, but we're applying it here to um, 
uh, to market failure. And I have an economics concepts, economic concepts handout uh, for more details on this. I could spend several lectures on this, and I'm going to try to just whiz through it quickly. But you should have these two ideas in your head, market failure, government failure. So there is a there are two theories of government regulation, two kind of broad theories of government regulation. Uh, one is goes back to the idea of public interest, right? So so it's an idealized uh, version of how government acts, again, kind of based on the idea that men, when they get elected to office, become angels all of a sudden. Um, and so this is an idealized government agent acts to bring about the greatest well-being uh, to the citizens, the government, the agent Govern. So when someone gets elected to office, they and they only focus on providing the best possible outcomes for all um, all citizens. Now, we all know that uh, if you've been around long enough that government agents, the government politicians, excuse me, politicians, number one, are focused on being reelected. So they respond very strongly to to pressures from the electorate that may or may not allow them to be reelected. And they're not going to do things that they don't think will, or that they think will cause them not to be reelected, even if that's not in the best interest of the community. And the Nirvana fallacy is usually um, comparing comparing reality to an idealized possible outcome this is the this is used by people who want to make an argument that hey we've got this market outcome it maybe is delivering 80 percent of what we would i you know ideally want and we say well you know we really want 100 percent. and so what we'll do is we'll take this out of the hands of competing medical groups competing hospitals and we'll put it into the hands of a government policy maker who will fix it the problem is that you're probably not going to get that hundred percent uh, uh, that hundred percent outcome by comparing, uh, excuse me, by giving over management of a complex market process to a government agent. So the Nirvana fallacy, Nirvana, Nirvana fallacy, uh, is the tendency to assume that there's some ideal solution and that it can and then we're comparing what reality generates to um uh to what might possibly be possible so uh communism is a great example you know there's always you know there's fans of communism always say well real communism hasn't been tried yet but every example of communism that we've ever seen in reality uh, results in murder and misery. So I'm good with that, right? But the communism is, is a good example of the Nirvana Nirvana fa fa fallacy. So we have public interest theory or public interest theory is basically government agents are out there acting in their uh on behalf holding holding the interests of citizens uh in their minds as they go forward. Public choice says and this is this is the theory that I identify with and I was trained with is that government agents uh, are human, right? And they act to maximize their own interests, not necessarily the interests of the citizens that they, they govern. Um, and so this is this goes with the Federalist quote that I gave you, which is, you know, you take a human being who has the desire and willingness to run for office that's a person who's got a pretty strong ego uh, and they may be driven in their own minds by a sense that they will be the best possible leader. But when they get into office, what we see time and time again is they act in such a way as to, is to make sure that they keep on getting elected. Um, and so public choice really just says, look, human beings don't stop being human beings just because they get elected to federal uh, to government office federal state otherwise so public choice acknowledges both market failure and government failure whereas public interest really only acknowledges market failure um i have a great uh podcast 
called Bootleggers and uh, about Bootleggers and Baptists, which I will share with you and I highly recommend. Uh, but I'm not going to go into it here for sake of time. Okay, so let's talk about how federal regulation has emerged in healthcare over the uh, over the last century, a little more than century. So in 1906. You know, we're going through the Industrial Revolution, starting in the 1750s, really kind of wild times. We're starting to see industrialization of the food supply. So in the 1800s, so in the 19th century, you know, earlier and earlier, you would have only eaten food that was produced near near you. But as rail cars are invented, uh, as the railroad comes online and, and spreads, and as, sorry, as refrigerated rail cars become a common thing, we can now move in particular meat long distances. So it used to be, if you wanted to have a piece of steak, you would buy it from your local butcher who lived down the street from you because there was no way to transport butchered meat. So, so meat that had, or, you know, animals that had been slaughtered, butchered, turned into steaks, right? It used to be such that, you know, if you wanted a steak, you walked down the street to the local butcher because there was no way to transport meat safely once it had been butchered over long distances. Well, enter the rail car and suddenly we can transport meat long distances safely. And so there was a whole lot of question about whether it really was safe. So we went from having local supplies of meat to having centralized supplies of meat. So Chicago and the Chicago area continues to be one of the largest suppliers of meat uh, in the country. And suddenly you had meat coming from Chicago to New Hampshire, for example. And we wanted to make sure that uh, amongst other things that that meat supply was safe, right? And so not and so it becomes not only meat, but all sorts of other, supplies of food and drugs are coming from all over the place rather than local supplies. And so 1906, the federal government gets into the act of, of regulating food and drugs between states. So this is, we'll talk more about this, but in the U.S. Constitution, I've kind of made reference to this, but in the U.S. Constitution, Regulation of economic activity is given to the states. The only economic role that the federal government is supposed to have is for interstate commerce. So once you start shipping, so if you're slaughtering meat in New Hampshire and selling it in New Hampshire, the US federal government isn't supposed to have any role in regulating whether the meat is safe or whether it was done humanely and so on and so on. But once you start shipping, meats, foods, drugs across state lines. So for example, you're shipping it from Chicago, Illinois to Durham, New Hampshire, where we are here at UNH. Now the federal government can step in because that is interstate commerce. It's going from one state to another state. And so now the federal government has constitutionally has the right to regulate such trade. So we have the Pure, Pure Food and Drugs Act creates... Um, uh, the you know, USDA's Division of Chemistry to regulate such things, right? So we're now we're looking at, you know, trying to make sure that stuff isn't being added inappropriately. And you know what? Stuff was. Uh, there's always, uh, again, people are people. They're always trying to make a buck. Um, most people are perfectly good, but not all. And so we had people putting bad stuff into food uh, to try to make an extra profit. So 1930, uh, the Food and Drug Administration is, is implemented for this uh, function. In 1938, we have the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic FDC Act um, in response to a poisoning. So this is uh, from sulf Elixir of sulfon <laughs> Sulfanilamonide. I can't say it. Anyway, uh, sulfa drugs we'll talk more about later, but self drugs were some of the early antibiotics um, that uh, were really important. And some some 
kids get poisoned in 1938 uh, by a manufacturer who was who did this who made this drug inappropriately. So now the FDA is is allowed to regulate the pre marketing safety of drugs and devices. So. I, um, and this is, I, I want to focus here. This is just on safety. So if they say the, the difference between safety and efficacy, which we get into in the next line, the difference between safety and efficacy um, is that safety means if I say, here's my drug and I want you to take, you know, one ounce of it once a day, safety means if you take this drug, it won't kill you. It won't, it won't poison you. It does not mean that it will actually do what I say it's going to do. So I could sell you um, a thing that I claim is a drug under the safety regime. I could sell you a thing that I claim is a drug, you know, and it's in a little bottle and I say, take one ounce a day and you take it one ounce a day and you're fine. It could just be, I could be selling you a bottle of water and I'm telling you this will cure you, but it's really just a bottle of water. It's safe. And under this under the safety regime only, um, the company doesn't have to prove that it actually works. All they have to prove to the government is that it's safe to take in the dose that is recommended. In 1962, we have the Kefauver Harris drug amendments in response to the to thalidomide, which allow the FDA to conduct pre-market reviews of safety and efficacy. So thalidomide was a drug that was uh, was being prescribed to mothers to help with morning sickness. So, so when they're pregnant, so young uh, mothers who are pregnant, um, you get morning sickness, which makes you feel like you want to vomit. So people were uh, mothers, pregnant mothers were being, were being prescribed thalidomide what happened is it turns out is thalidomide, if someone take if a if a woman who is pregnant takes thalidomide um it can result in birth defects specifically it causes malformation of the limbs so the hands and the feet and the legs and the arms um and it's a really tragic thing and if you look up thalidomide on the internet you'll see uh, some some images of children who were born with these deformities as a result of thalidomide so this is really a safety issue, but it winds up, you know, it winds up giving the federal government power uh, to to review new drugs, not only for safety, but also for efficacy. In 1976, we extend this pre, pre-market review to medical devices. So we're starting to have medical devices more widely sold on the marketplace. And so we start... Um, regulating those as well. And I want to pause here for a second. So we have the market, right? Market failure, government and and government intervention. So market failure, you could argue that people were people manufacturers of drugs and medical devices were not taking adequate care as they started to develop and market these new interventions for the marketplace. And so we had a market failure. We had a failure to provide safe and efficacious drugs and medical devices. And so we needed the government, federal government to step in and regulate. So that's a good example of a market failure where the government steps in and regulates. So then in 1983, we have the Orphan Drug Act, which provides incentives for um, pharmaceutical companies to research and manufacture drugs for rare diseases. So there are people who have unusual diseases. I always, I joke, I joke uh, a lot uh, with my physician colleagues that you never want to be the interesting patient, right? Doctors love interesting patients, but you never actually want to be the interesting patient, right? Because nobody knows what's wrong with you and trying to figure it out. Well, people who, there are people who have rare diseases. They are often misdiagnosed because they're, the disease itself is rare, and eventually, once it is in fact diagnosed, a lot of times pharmaceutical companies can't make a can't sell enough of the drug to make a profit to justify making the drug. So this is another market failure, right? Pharmaceutical companies would be more than happy to make the drug to treat the rare disease. The problem is there it because it's the disease is rare, there aren't a lot of consumers to, to who want the drug. And so in order for the pharmaceutical company to produce the drug, they would have to charge 
uh, charge a cost that would exceed the patient's ability to buy the drug. And so this is another example of a market failure. So now the government steps in, provides incentives, money, in other words, to drugs to do research, excuse me, to pharmaceutical companies to do research, to manufacture drugs for small population, people who are, you know, by definition, if it's a rare disease, it's a small population that might buy the drug. Um, 1992, uh, we have the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. This now um, requires uh, uh uh, manufacturers of drugs and biologics to pay fees for product applications and supplements um, in order in order to better fund the FDA to um, accelerate the process. So here's a government an example of government failure. So we had all, all these steps that we've talked about, right? Going back to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the Kef Alver Kefauver Harris drug amendment, right, to fix things that were were problems in the marketplace, right, generating unsafe drugs, unsafe medical devices, not generating enough drugs uh, or uh, for rare diseases. So we have all these problems that government steps in to fix by regulating. Those regulations effectively slow down the process of review. And now we realize, wow, the treatment that we put into place, right, the government regulations that we put into place to try to fix these problems is creating a new problem, which is it's slowing down the approval of drugs, uh, new drugs and new uh, uh, equipment, right? So on the one hand, we're trying to be safer, but that, you know, whenever you try to be safe at anything, it always causes you to slow down. And so- now what we're doing is yet another government intervention to try to fix the problem that was created by the first government interventions. So this is an example of government failure. So government steps in to try to fix a market failure, actually makes the problem, fixes one problem, but creates a whole new problem. All right. So cost-benefit analysis. This is done, especially in countries like the UK that have government-funded um, government funded, government run programs. So the UK, Canada, you know, most Western countries where the government has a much larger role in regulating the delivery of healthcare. And the, the cost benefit analysis basically tries to figure out is a new technology, is the cost of a new technology worth it, right? Is the juice worth the squeeze, as as uh, one of my colleagues used to like to say? So we have to measure benefits in dollars. And so here's an example. So so typically what we use as an economic measure, and this is one of those heartless things that economists do, but we say one year of human life is worth about $100,000. So if I can extend your life by one year, that should be worth about $100,000 in benefits. So we should be willing to pay hundred up to $100,000 to extend life one year. So if the treatment, so if, for example, the treatment costs $200,000, but it extends life three years, we have a benefit to cost ratio of 1.5. So what we're trying to do is we're taking the benefits, the juice, divided by the by the cost of the squeeze, right? And saying any ratio greater than one tells us that we have a benefit to cost ratio greater than one. So therefore, this is worth doing. If we have a benefit to cost ratio less than one, then we're paying more for the treatment than we get for the benefit, right? So if it was, if it was, the cost was, um, uh, $500,000, but it only extends life one year. Well, that would be $100,000 in benefit divided by $500,000 in cost. That would be one fifth or 0.2. So that's less than one. So that's not something we would want to do. And that's how countries like the UK, when they, when the U S develops a new technology, the UK does a little cost benefit analysis and says, okay, we're not going to, you know, if the, if the benefit to cost ratio is less than one, then we're not going to allow our citizens access to this technology, or they can go buy it on their own, but we're not going to pay for it through the national health service. 
that's a pretty crude measure. So a better measure is the quality adjusted life year or quality. And the idea here is that, yeah, a treatment might keep you alive, right? So you'll get one more year of life, but your quality of life is going to be low. So for example, I can give you a treatment. It's going to put you on a ventilator. Uh, you'll technically be alive, but you will be in a coma on a ventilator. What's your quality of life for that one year? Yeah, it's not that good, right? I just assume be dead. I don't really want to be uh, in a coma on a ventilator. I'm effectively not alive. So the idea is that a year is not a year, right? And so one year on a ventilator, you know, again, one year alive. Now, let's say now you're not in a coma, but you're you're aware, but you're on a ventilator. Uh, so you can't, you know, you can't get out of bed. You can't do any of the normal activities of daily living that we just kind of take for granted. Well, that might, you know, it might be better than being dead, but it's only worth, say, 0.2 quality. And so what we're saying now instead is we're, we're adjusting that uh, life year from being worth $100,000 to 20% of that. So maybe $20,000. Now we plug that into our benefit cost ratio and it changes uh, our perspective on whether the intervention is worthwhile or not. So these are used by health economists who work for government agencies in particular to determine whether a, whether a new technology is worth funding or not. Insurance companies in the United States also use this sort of thing to determine whether the insurance company will cover a new benefit. So it's not just countries with government agencies making those decisions. It's also... Um, it's also for-profit insurance companies in a competitive environment like the United States. Now, an another way uh, of managing, right? So we're trying to deal with cost, quality, and access. So in the United States, price-based rationing, right? So there's all there's never enough of 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 a good to go around. There's never enough doctor visits. There's never enough hospital days, there's never enough drugs and so forth. So we can we can decide who gets how much of a limited resource in a couple of ways. But the decision to allocate is called rationing, right? So whenever we have a limited resource, we have to ration. And we can basically do two kinds of rationing. One is price-based, rationing, which means that the market is going to make that decision. In other words, the rich get anything they want, the poor have to choose and may not get anything. So if you're so price-based rationing means really boils down to if you can afford it, you can have it, which is pretty pretty crude and kind of barbaric when you start talking about people's health. So because that's a generally offensive to most people when it's presented that way, we see a lot of non-price-based rationing. So in other words, this is if we're not going to do it through the market, we're going to do it through government. And so we're going to do it through a political process. And that is, <coughs> so that's the National Health Service in uh, the UK, for example. They still engage, and, and Canada, they still engage in rationing, but it's a political process. So it's especially important, you know, like I say here, when when patients aren't paying for their own care. So the UK patients pay nothing for their care. And so therefore patients will look at care and will consume more care because they don't see it as 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 a dollar cost to them. So they're not thinking about, hmm, you know, if I buy this particular care, then I can't buy something, I can't go buy that new TV set that I really want. Instead, what they what patients in the UK say is. I'm going to get my care because the government owes it to me and I'm going to go buy the TV set. But in the United States, you have to choose, right? Because it's price-based rationing. Healthcare in the United States is mostly price-based rationing. You wind up having to choose between the healthcare and the new TV set or worse, the healthcare and food or the healthcare and rent, right? Depending on how poor you are. Um, and that's one of the awful things about being poor is you're always having to make these really hard choices. So, <laughs> excuse me. What 
when we do non-price-based rationing, we tend to engage in a lot of supply side controls. And so supply is generally rationed by the government. And the result is you create waiting periods. So we say something like, well, we're just going to have, you know, MRIs are really expensive. So we're only going to have one MRI for every 100,000 people. Well, as a result, you wind up with really long lines of people waiting to get to the one MRI. And so in places like Canada, you might have to wait two or three months to get an MRI, which is a, an, an imaging scan for soft tissue. So if you have knee pain, you might have to wait six months to get your MRI done, right? So Canada has these really long waiting periods. And, you know, as a result, uh, if you live near the, the U.S. border in Canada, there are a lot of U.S. medical providers that specialize in providing cash basis care. So, so care to Canadians, for cash, uh, because uh, the Canadian government won't pay for it, and they don't have insurance. So Canadians come across the border and pay cash for a lot of things like MRIs in northern states. Uh, so supply side controls include things like waiting periods, right? So we limit the amount of technology that's available, and that generates waiting periods. We engage in really strong or stringent approval of technologies and treatments. So we require a really high benefit to cost ratio. So not just like a, a benefit to cost ratio of one, but maybe a benefit cost ratio of three, for example, right? And then we limit formularies. So, so a formulary is a list of drugs that are provided by a particular pharmacy. So if you're, if you're, in the UK and you're going through the NHS, all the pharmacies are run by the NHS. So the NHS then determines what drugs get sold, not sold, excuse me, but but are approved to be given to patients. And if there's a drug that you're, you'd like to get because it's kind of cutting edge, the UK NHS might not approve that. And so you'll just have to take something else. Uh, whereas in the United States, Usually it's a situation where, well, the insurance company won't approve it. So if you want it, you can pay cash or not. Um, the risk here is that rationing based on is really ultimately based on political influence and power. Um, and so particular individuals with a lot of political power or interest groups with a lot of political power, so think majorities, will more likely be able to get the kinds of technologies they want implemented and minorities, whether that's race, gender, so forth, um, will be less likely to get access to the care and the kinds of care that they want. So that's the downside of non-price rationing is on the one hand, you know, it's kind of barbaric to think about limiting access to care based on your ability to pay. But on the other hand, now you are now po politicians are making decisions about what kind of care is going to be available or not available. And they're responding to their incentives to get reelected. And so if you live, for example, in a conservative state, you know, or in a conservative, uh, uh, with a conservative, with conservative politicians, you know, they'll probably make abortion illegal. And if you can only get your care through, non-price based rationing they'll just make they'll just be like yeah yeah abortion we're not we're not approving that um so that's that's an example uh or um yeah so that that's a good example right so let's keep going all right another government intervention is a certificate of need law this was pa was created uh, as a national requirement by the National Health Planning and Resource Development Act of 1974. By the 70s, right? So Medicare comes online in 1965. So by nine years later, we could already see we had created a monster uh, and that healthcare spending was growing at a, at a rate that we were already deeply concerned about, never mind where we are now. And um, so Congress passes this 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 law that says basically that states have to implement certificate of need boards uh, in order to get access to certain benefits from the federal government. So what does a certificate of need board do? Well, it basically it says that if you want to 
provide be a new provider of a particular kind of service. So if you wanted to build a new hospital, you want to build a new nursing home, uh, or even if you're a hospital that's already pre-existing, but you want to add a new service. So for example, you want to add, you want to buy an MRI machine and you didn't have one before, you'd have to go to the certificate of need board, which was made up of a group of, of community members who may or may not have a particular interest in keeping you from getting your new MRI or building your new nursing home. You would have to go to them and get permission. So it's a mother may I kind of thing. Like, can I go ahead and do this thing with my own money and my own time and my own risk? Uh, I have to now ask your permission to do that. Um, the idea was that we had the con boards would prevent replication and uh, replication of services and destructive competition, right? Unhealthy competition uh, in the market. So, you know, the argument was we don't really need, you know, so, so one argument would be we don't really need in, you know, in, in, the seacoast area around Durham. So Durham's on the New Hampshire seacoast. We call our area the seacoast. We, we only really need like one MRI. We don't really need five MRIs, right? And so if there are five MRIs, what we know is if doctors know that there are five MRIs, they'll use those MRIs more often. They'll send more patients to get the MRI. They won't pause and think, well, it's going to take six weeks to get MRI. I'm just going to skip that for my patient. Instead, they're going to send their patients to get MRIs. And if their patients are Medicare beneficiaries, then the federal government winds up paying for the additional MRIs. So one way to keep MRIs from happening is to make it hard to get MRIs, right? And we can, not just MRIs, but heart surgery, knee surgery, so on and so on, right? All these things uh, the were costly to the government. So one way to limit the cost of the government was to limit access by limiting the number of, of service providers. So this is a form of Right. This is a form of supply side rationing. Um, so the mandate was repealed in 1987, along with the associated federal uh, funding. But most states still to this day have con laws. New Hampshire got rid of theirs back in about 2015. But Vermont, just next door to us, has some of the most pervasive con laws in the country. Uh, they're they're run by the Green Mountain Care Board, which is, you know, when you talk to uh, people who work in health policy uh, and work with providers, they regard the Green Mountain Care Board as just uh, really unfortunate and creates a lot of red tape and doesn't really add any value. Let's just be blunt. It doesn't really add any value. But what it does do is creates a lot of power for particular political groups. Uh, and so it's very attractive to certain political groups. And so they keep it in place. But it probably, on, uh, on the whole, decreases the quality of quality, cost quality, and access of care in the state of Vermont. Now, here's the here's the kind of dirty side of con laws that everybody understands, and that is this: <clears throat> if I wanted to say build a new hospital in Durham, right? And I was like, well, Durham doesn't have a hospital for those of you who are not from uh, actually from Durham or go to school here at UNH. Durham doesn't have a hospital, but there is a hospital in Dover. There's a hospital in Portsmouth. There's a hospital in Exeter. There's a hospital in Rochester. So we're kind of surrounded by towns that have hospitals, but we don't have our own hospital. So if, some, if a group of entrepreneurs got together and said, hey, you know what, let's build a hospital in Durham uh, because there's a need for a hospital. You know, we think we could make a profit by building a hospital in Durham. You'd have to go to the con board right, to get approval for this. If there was a con board, which there isn't anymore, but back before nine, before 2015, you would have had to do this. So I go to the let's let's imagine I'm I have a proposal to go to the to build this hospital in Durham. I go to the con board and I say, hey, I'd like to build a a hospital in Durham. Now the con board will say, does anybody have an objection to to Bonica and his crew building a hospital in Durham. Well, who do you think would show up to say, you know, we don't really need another hospital in Durham. We've already got these, all these great hospitals all around us. All the people who, all the CEOs of all the hospitals that surround Durham would show up at this meeting to say, we don't really need another hospital, right? So the CEO of Exeter, the CEO of, of the Dover hospital, the CEO of the Portsmouth hospital, CEO of the Rochester hospital would all have an interest 
in making an argument that there's no actual need for a hospital in Durham. Why would they do that? Because the hospital in Durham, if I was to build one in Durham, would take business away from those hospitals. And so that's the bald faced kind of of inner of, of stuff that would happen during uh, when when we had con laws. It, con laws wind up protecting incumbents, meaning businesses that are already operating in a particular industry. So it protects incumbents from competition. And whenever you do that, you wind up having worse quality, worse cost, and worse access. So it sounds like a great idea uh, on paper. In execution, it winds up actually harm, harming the community that's meant to, to support, which is why uh, you're starting to see con laws go away and why New Hampshire should be should be praised for its for its uh, approach to eliminating such nonsense. All right, <clears throat> so let's now talk about some actual medical devices. So we'll start by talking about medical equipment. So broadly, this is any equipment that's used by a provider to deliver care. It has complements and substitutes. So we're going to come back to that again. Specialists heavily rely <clears throat> on medical equipment to complement their um, their delivery of care. So think about a, a radiologist, right? What is a radiologist? Is a person that reads imaging studies done by equipment. So what's a radiologist without an x-ray machine or an MRI or a CT or any of the other kinds of scanners? A radiologist literally is um, no different than me if if he or she doesn't have access to his or her equipment. Surgeons. Right. So, but a radiologist who has access to an MRI is a super valuable thing. And so equipment is a complement to a radiologist. A radiologist by himself is pretty useful, pretty useless, but a radiologist with imaging equipment is super valuable. <coughs> um, surgeons are, are are starting to use robots. They're one of the more famous ones is called the Da Vinci robot. Um and uh, this now, the robot is a complement to the surgeon in that a surgeon who has been trained to use a robot does can do procedures faster, so therefore it increases access, at a, and at a higher quality. The quality outcomes of robotic surgery are better than the than with than surgery without robot robotic support. So that's another example of a compliment. Now, a surgeon, unlike a radiologist, a surgeon is still pretty valuable without uh, some equipment, but even a surgeon has to have some equipment, right? They need anesthesia. They need a whole bunch of other stuff. So one of the things that I like to think about, and we'll talk more about this uh, as we talk about hospitals, is the hospital is really kind of a doctor's workshop. Um, hospitals compete to attract physicians by providing high-quality technology, um, hospitals, doctors can't afford most of the technology that hospitals provide for the doctor to do his or her work. And so the hospital becomes a centerpiece of America, of, of medicine across the developed world, uh, because it becomes a repository of high cost technology. So a typical radiologist can't afford to have her own MRI machine. Um, and so instead, the radiologist shares an MRI machine with other radiologists and the hospital buys the uh, machines. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about doctor's workshop idea as we go along. Now, nursing, some equipment allows for substitution, i.e., if we use the technology, we can we have we have to hire fewer nurses, and some equipment allows for improved monitoring. So then that's a an example of a complement. I should have that written in there. Um, so complementary technology tends to increase the wages of the person using the technology. So let's here's a couple of examples of. So I keep talking about MRI. So here's here's a patient going through an MRI. And then here's the image that the MRI generates. So we, so an X-ray can't give you this level of clarity of soft tissue, right? So X-rays are really good for looking at bones, hard tissue, but soft tissue like organ systems uh, or cartilage, 
doesn't show up as well on x-ray. And so MRIs are super valuable for that. Now, <clears throat> I was saying, um, complements, individuals that use a complementary technology tend to earn more. So think about this. Would you pay a, who would you pay more to dig a ditch? Um, uh, a man with a shovel or a man with um a backhoe or who would you have to pay more if you were hiring people to to dig you know there's a reason why people in in developing countries make a lot less income it's because they tend to have access to less technology if you're a backhoe operator you make you can make a really good living because and the reason you can do that is because you can dig a ditch you can dig 10 ditches in a day right with your if you're operating your backhoe so you can charge 10 customers for 10 ditches but if you're a guy with a shovel you might only get half a ditch done in a day right so you're going to have if you're a backhoe operator and you have a backhoe right importantly you have the technology you can make a lot more income and so doctors who have access to high tech equipment can do a lot more, a lot more patients can see more patients and can do higher quality care. And so therefore they earn more income. So a complement is an expensive, you know, can be an expensive technology. So is an MRI really necessary? Well, in the U S you know, there are a lot more MRIs per 100,000 people than there are in almost any other developed nation. Right. So is it really necessary? Well, in reality, we probably in the US, we probably use MRIs more often exactly because we have more of them. But an MRI is really expensive. An X-ray might cost $100, whereas an MRI might cost $1,000 for the same, you know, same imaging. Now, the quality isn't the same. Like I said, you're not going to get this quality of image with an X-ray. And so, but the question is, is it really is it really medically indicated to use the MRI as often as we do? Here's an image of robotic surgery. Um, you know, this is an ex this is a Da Vinci robot. You can see the name right there. Here's the surgeon sitting over here. Here's the patient. Isn't that wild? The pa the surgeon is a few feet away. He's not not in another room, but he's a few feet away from uh, the patient doing surgery using some joysticks. And here's the, you know, here's the equipment. Now, this piece of equipment is like a million dollars, right? A million dollars to buy one of these bad boys. And then it comes with a pretty expensive tail um, in the sense of like a maintenance tail. So this is a, a lot of money. And the hospital, here's the important thing. The hospitals don't, have, hospitals and, and or the physicians don't have the ability to charge more because they're using the robot because they're doing the same surgery. It's just being done with a robot assistance. Um, so that's a that's a challenge. We have uh, here's an example of a complement to nursing staff. This is a smart hospital bed, um, and what this can do, right? You can see all the kind of the uh, readouts here. What the hosp a smart hospital bed can do is transmit uh, things like blood pressure, pulse, all this sort of information to a computer system that the nurse can then monitor from the nurse's station. So you don't have to have a nurse go in and take your blood pressure every hour because the bed is doing it while you lay in it, right? So that's an example, you know, so now we can have fewer nurses because we're not doing these kind of mundane tasks of going out and taking blood pressures every hour. So that allows you to get, have fewer nurses to provide the same level of care, or it allows you to improve the quality of, of, the care because the blood pressure is being done constantly automatically rather than just every hour. But again, one of these, one of these smart beds costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's not a cheap thing. We have uh, some, some cute delivery robots. So, so again, this is a great substitute for low wage workers, right? So we have a lot of people in hospitals that do things like deliver food trays that, pick up medication and deliver it from the pharmacy to the ward where the patients are, or picks up lab, you know, 
lab uh, blood samples or urine samples that are being drawn on the ward and takes them down to the hospital laboratory. Well, if if the if you could just summon a little robot, you know, if the nurse on the ward can summon a little robot and say, "Hey, it's time for Mrs. Smith's um, uh, medications," and the robot gets some, you know, gets told, "Hey, go pick up the medications from the pharmacy." Now a a uh, aid doesn't have to be paid to walk back and forth carrying trays of medications from the pharmacy up to the ward or trays of food from the from the dining uh, facility up to the uh, from the cafeteria up to the um, up to the ward right so this eliminates this is a substitute for nursing or or unskilled labor uh, another, uh, a complementary technology that is also a substitute uh, is patient lifts. So here's an example of a lift being used by a probably a, a CNA, a nurse's uh, uh, or an LNA, depending if you're in New Hampshire or not, right? And what we're doing is we're we're helping a patient do a transfer. I talked about this in the last class, right? So this this elderly woman maybe is not capable of getting out of her bed and into her wheelchair or getting out of her bed and using the commode. And so the aid is using this lift technology, which enables her to do to do, make the transfer more safely. It's less likely that the patient gets injured. And it's also less likely that the nurse's aide gets injured. Nurses aides and nurses get a lot of injuries from trying to move patients. So if we can eliminate some of those injuries, right, we can improve the experience of the patient. We can improve the quality of experience for the provider. And we can also do it with fewer people. Now you're supposed to be doing this with two people <clears throat> for safety purposes, but imagine trying to, even a small woman uh, like this, the woman in this picture, but imagine say, uh, you know, a patient who's 300 pounds, trying to make that transfer for somebody who's 300 pounds who can't help you because they are 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 uh, disabled in some way. So this is a, an example that's both kind of a is both a um, complement in the sense that it improves the quality of experience of the patient and and the provider and a substitute. You're able to do the same thing with less manpower. All right, so we'll stop there. Uh, for part one, and I'll pick up again with part two here in a minute, or whenever you're ready to watch it, right? That's the miracle of uh, having it all online.